Hey, hi, hello. Welcome to episode 45 of Trail Society brought to you by our friends over at Free Trail. I'm Corinne Malcolm. And I'm Keely Henninger. And we're missing our good friend Hillary Allen today. She's got some some busy life stuff going on, but she'll be back with us soon, hopefully for our our one year reunion of my post Madeira recap in a couple of weeks, which I'm excited about. Um, big things have been going on in the free trail fam with uh, Gorge Waterfalls this past weekend. Um, Keely, you were out on course a little bit, I think on Sunday. How were the vibes out there? Oh man, the vibes on Sunday were so fun. Um, as per usual for these races, I think Portland really shows up for the Gorge races. And so it feels like a really big reunion every year because it's almost like we're all re-emerging from the winter where we haven't really hung out with a lot of people. Um, so it's like a nice kickoff to the running season. And there was a lot of energy at all of the aid stations. People were running, you know, fast given the crazy conditions. It was yeah. so sloppy. Um, I was crewing for an athlete who ended up getting top 10 and she was like so stressed about what to wear and ultimately ended up not mattering because we got rain, snow, hail, dry, sun, (laughs) snow, like, you know, it's all over the place. You can't really stress about it at the end of the day because it was just kind of crazy. And it really put on a show for everybody. Um, really did not, um, convince many people to want to move to Portland. So, <laughs> you know, which that's not a bad thing, I guess, you know, we'll keep the PNW weird, but I was talking to, we'll talk about results here in a second, but I was talking to Dylan and Ryan in our kind of post post weekend haze. I was at a wedding, um, coming back into like back into the world after that wedding slash my birthday. It was a great fun field weekend of lots and lots of cake basically. Um, but I was texting with Dylan and Ryan and I was like, how are you guys? And Dylan is like, I am so dead. And yet I am so excited already for 2024. <laughs> yeah. Dylan was a trooper for sure. I'm he clearing my there. calendars. I'm clearing yes, my you calendar need to come. for next year. Ellie Pell and I have been joking that like, do we think it's possible to do the triple? Like, could Oof. you survive three mm. days of it? Mm-hmm. Not, I think performance would not be high, but performance I performance like, wouldn't be high. Mental status pretty low. <laughs> yeah. Maybe dire, maybe a lot of aid station time, particularly in the 50K on Sunday, I think. Yeah. And just having to run that same section of trail three, four times. It'd be pretty brutal. <laughs> I think you have to be training. I'm sure someone specific, will do it. Right? I'm sure someone will do it in the next year. I, I think if you've it. got Cocodona or something coming up, mm-hmm. right? Like maybe that's not a bad training block where you just kind of make it a stage race of yeah. doom and hopefully it's not hailing. I mean, watching people race in like tights and multiple jackets I was like yeah I know I had one athlete who I told her just to do as much as she could in her power to make it super enjoyable she changed her shirt three times and I'm like that's great yeah love it like might as well be as comfortable as you can because either way it's freaking cold (laughs) I mean I changed my my shirt a bunch in long races and it's not even that wet so Mm -hmm. um okay we'll uh we'll put a, a tiny pin in that And we'll come back to results in a second and we'll like wax poetically about how amazing everyone was. But I just want to like do a shout out. We're going to talk about some NCAA women's basketball. We're also going to talk about getting sick, um, being sick, being sick in the race season, training with illness, et cetera. I think uh, it'll be a topic that hits home for many people right now. And hopefully a topic that you can come back to next time you find yourself under the weather. Um, It'll be a good good re-listen. But before we dive into results, we need to talk a little bit about one of our sponsors who makes this whole thing possible. And that is the folks over at AG1. They've been with us for, I feel like since the beginning at this point, helping to support us. Um, I actually just had my daily AG1 in a smoothie post sauna session. So I'm hoping for a little extra magic maybe. And, or I'm just going to be super, super loopy during this as I come out of the sauna, but AG1 on board, hopefully that will uh, focus, focus my mind on things. But big thing is if you would like to try AG1, you can go over to www.athleticgreens.com slash trail society there with your first purchase. You can get a one year, one year free supply of immune supporting vitamin D talk about the immune system today. So this is great. It all ties Mm -hmm. in. And then you can also get um, five free travel packs as well. So again, that's over at www.athleticgreens.com slash trail society. Get your hands on some AG1 today. Mm-hmm. Okay. The vitamin D is crucial for P and up winters. Truly, truly. Yeah. I had an athlete get blood testing recently and they're Oof. like, my poor vitamin D. I'm like, have you been supplementing? You just survived winter. Like, of course it's not going to be good. 
<laughs> yeah, I know. I, I put a little dollop in my smoothie whenever I make one. I love it. And to be fair too, we're going to talk a lot about the immune system today, but you know, like to build red blood cells, you need things like vitamin D and B12 and folate and all these other things mm-hmm. um, in order to, you know, have good iron stores and actually build red blood cells that are important, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Super important for a lot of things. Yeah. So that's a rabbit hole for another day, I guess, but we want to talk more about gorge and more about other races too, but gorge, gorge, gorge. We're all about gorge waterfalls. You probably heard enough about it at this point, but I can't get enough of it. And I'm really hopeful that the 30 K the Friday 30 K I feel like it could become like the sub ultra U S like season opener. Mm-hmm. Right. Like I feel like we had pretty good fields this year for like the inaugural 30 K, mm-hmm. but I think that it can be like the hype is there and I think it's going to grow next year. Yeah. And I would also love to see it go up Wakina. Yeah. They don't oh, have yeah. a really big climb. They just run the 400 basically from Multnomah to the bike path and then into Cascade Locks. And so it's not a ton of climbing. I feel like if you threw that big Wakina climb in, in the beginning, made everyone hammer up that, that could throw a little wrench in the, in the race too. But that's just, that's just me wanting to see that. But yeah, it's a speedy course regardless. There's a lot of road in relation to the mileage. So like really got some blistering times. Yeah. People, people were fast out there. And I think for a lot of people too, it was like a tune up for the upcoming, um, soon scramble, uh, the VK and the classic up down, which is mm-hmm. the U S team qualifier for those events for the, the vertical and for the classic up, up down mountain race. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually many of the people that were racing, including Bailey Kowalczyk and, and Sam Lewis. And, um, I think Liam, um, Miro as well, they will all be going to uh, the Sun of Peace Scramble. Mm-hmm. Um, if you want to hear more about that, actually, Subhub, Danny Moreno and MK Sullivan just released a podcast um, kind of previewing that race. So go mm-hmm. go over there and listen to that when you're done with this. Yeah. And go listen to Danny and MK. <laughs> but yeah, um, it's a good distance for people to get into trail from, you know, yeah. like a very digestible distance. Yeah. There are some, for, a lot of first time trail runners, trail yeah. racers. The guy who there. won, he's been part of the Wallabies now. And he's because he's it. looking to get into trails. He's a roadie slash track guy, super fast, who's deciding to come into trail. And so he's been lifting with us. And he was so stoked for this race. It was his longest trail race and or I guess longest trail run. And I made him get a water bottle beforehand. So then he had a water bottle with him and he crushed him. So he fun. had his bib pinned on like a true roadie, too. It was just like <laughs> center of his chest. Um, I was like, no, no folded up, no pin to the leg, no pin to low on, on the tank. It was, uh-huh. it was just like front and center pinned on the front of him. And I just was like, ah, so our, good. our road boy is here. But yeah, so in the women's side, um, Bailey Kowalczyk won. I think she was like fifth or sixth overall. Um, super good to see her racing strong early in the season. She had a late start to her season last year. Um, so excited to see that Sam Lewis on athlete was second. And then, um, Eric, uh, not Aaron, Aaron Fredrickson, um, was third. She's um, a family medicine resident, uh, Mm -hmm. here in Seattle. Um, who I've like, we've been like, we've run past each other in opposite directions a bunch and hoping to actually link up with her at some point, but, um, cool to see her, uh, come in third there. And then on the men's side, you mentioned new, new to the Wallabies, Walsh's Wallabies group. You've got Liam Miro in first 205. Um, Matthew Bigham was second. Uh, I think he's a Oregon guy as well. Like maybe a Eugene guy. I should know that. And then, um, Ryan Hoke, who I believe is from Reno was in third. So really, really cool to see those athletes throw down in the 30 K and then hang out and like crew and do stuff for the rest of the week. Bailey was crewing, Mm -hmm. um, Matt Daniels in the 50 K. So huge shout outs to those athletes throwing down on Friday. And I'm going not in order of race weekend. I'm going in order of distance because that's how my brain works. So next up, it was actually the Sunday race, it's the 50K. There are some fun stories that happened out there. You were out there witnessing it. Mm-hmm. My big takeaways are Meg freaking Morgan, like <laughs> what a stud. And then also I heard that Matt tried to drop out at one point and mm-hmm. Bailey was like, no man, it's yep. a 50K. Yeah, this is I how was they with feel. her. Yeah, we were at mile 15 and she, I, I got there like a little bit after he left and she was like, man, he's like struggling. And he's like, 
saying that it's slipping all over the place. And I just, I, I tried to get him to keep going and he did he freaking kept going. And like, he'll even admit that he he was not having a good day and wanted to stop. Um, but he got some, some motivation on that last out and back section, which I think if you're lacking motivation and you have some energy left, that is where you're going to get it because you get to see how far you are from the lead. And it's a lovely out and back uphill to downhill. So if you're crushing, like you can make up so much time, um, and so I'm so stoked that he turned it around. He, I feel like he is such a gifted athlete and I'm so glad that he, he's, he's back and I hope he keeps this momentum going. Yeah. I hope he realizes that he's back. I feel like he's kind of just been hamstrung a little bit by various things, injury, illness, kind of some weird, some weird stuff, some life stuff. And he's actually, he's been very public about a bunch of it. Um, I know he dealt with a lot of like mental health stuff, um, from his previous time, um, like ser- like serving in the in the military, um, so I think he's been kind of working through a bunch of that. But it seems like he's in a much a much better place. So again, on the women's side, Meg Morgan, like Boulder so stud, just, yeah, so just, stoked the whole time too. So stoked. <laughs> um, it, I, it looks like her and Caitlin McDaniel ran together a bunch mm-hmm. of it. There's a great photo. I put it in the free trail write up of for Gorge. It's on the website of Meg and Caitlin hugging at the finish line, and it's Aww. such a great photo so and i don't think she raced a bunch last year and before that her only ultra sign up result was from like 2018 caitlin um yeah okay yeah her her husband was like she's definitely new to the scene and and we're really excited for her to keep 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 racing bigger races yeah she ran like a 50k back in like 2018 no results since then and then like she ran a bunch last year like a bunch of like colorado stuff i think she's a colorado gal yeah um I think she's doing Quadrac uh, 50 mile next. She's friends with Hannah all good. And awesome. she used to be a baller, basketballer. So we love a good basketballer. <laughs> so yeah. So Meg Morgan with the win, Caitlin McDaniel in second, and then Katie Asmuth, I think rallied for mm-hmm. third. Sounds like she kind of had a wonky, a wonky early bit to her day mm-hmm. after falling and banging. She really bruised. Bro- she really hurt her knee. She had to go get stitches after. Yeah. So, so she's not running, I think for a week or so. And then hopefully that heals quickly on the men's side, Matt Daniels rallied for the win. Um, it sounds like he was dropping some very, very fast miles mm-hmm. at the end. Um, Ryan Becker was second Ryan. Um, I feel like he's injured a lot, but when he's healthy, he's really, really, really good. Um, he, I feel like he just raced, didn't he? Mm-hmm. Did he race way too cool again? I think so, but I don't know. Yeah. He's, he's insanely talented. He's like one of those very, very talented human beings who I feel like is still constantly under the radar. Second here, um, you know, just a couple minutes. Yeah. Second, way too cool. Second here. Um, he's a speed land guy. Um, his partner, uh, Lindsay Allison, I think was maybe like fifth in the women's 50 K just half. Like she like, she is a person who will like walk away with more food than she like started with. Like she'll just like pocket lar bars and spring energy gels along the way. She's like, I'm making money on this race. Um, it's pretty great. You should run with her. And then uh, Dylan um, Humberger was third. So 24 nice, year old. Yeah. Super, super young, mm-hmm. young guy. I think, I feel like he's going to, I would just, I was just looking at his ultra sign up. Um, yeah. Like 23, 24 years old, excited to see kind of where the future is for him and then in the 100k which i think has been historically like the the premier event of this weekend i do think that the 30k and 50k are coming for it as far as depth and talent goes um which i have no problem with i want all these events to like really stand alone and be premier events riley brady took the win in the women's race they ran just under 10 hours i think 959 in very very sloppy conditions Lottie Brinks ran really hard in the back half of the race to um, stay in that second place position. And then Rachel Lemke finished in third out there. Um, Super, super solid racing by all three of them. The men's race, Vincent Bulliard, um, who is a French athlete, but lives in Portland Mm -hmm. and works for Hoka, um, who rumor has it was like running in a pair of like his own personal prototypes, which I Mm -hmm. love. Um, he was an early pace setter. Like he and Alex King were charging early and Alex fell back a bit. Trout Lake guy, local guy. And I was like, Ooh, who's this Vincent guy? Like, what's like, how's he going to, how's this going to work? Um, clearly not a problem. 828 new course record on this iteration of the course, which is like the new, which is the same as last year and will be the same course going forward. Um, first hundred K as well. Like what a badass! super excited to see that. Um, Seattle, 
um, guy, Blake um, Slattergren was second. And then our East coast representing for our third place male athlete was Caleb Bowen, um, Virginia. Is that right? I'm probably wrong there. Um, he's definitely an East, one of the East coast guys. Um, I feel like he ran black Canyon maybe and had a bunch of East coast guys cheering him on, but yeah, eight fifty six. So all three of them under the nine hour mark. Um, but yeah, super, super impressive racing from Vincent Bulliard first hundred K pretty good hundred K. Really cool. And yeah, then, I think he's from West Virginia. So not I, it sense, was, a, it was of Virginia. Yeah. Um, and then and he moved up. I feel like pretty steadily all day. The other big results that I wanted to shout out from the weekend are two speedy performances by, by athletes that we all know pretty well. Arlen Glick ran Umstead hundred mile, um, over the weekend. So freaking fast, like West. I mean, he runs, he races a lot. He runs, he generally runs several hundred miles a year. Him running a hundred mile now, I don't think is any sort of like, Ooh, how's Western States going to go type of thing. Him running sub 13 hours now to me is like, cool. Arlen is like, setting himself up well for Western States. He ran 1257, which breaks Mike Morton's 2012 course record, which was 1311. So super, super fast. Um, said is the race that Devin Yanko won outright last year, setting the women's new course record. So um, just really cool to see Arlen run super fast there, um, breaking that 13 hour barrier. And then I said, speaking of fire emojis, because in my notes, I put fire emoji after Arlen's um, name was that Grayson Murphy, um, you know, mount, short course mountain, total like crusher, going to be on the Golden Trail series a bit this year, which I'm so excited to see. Mm-hmm. Um, Grayson Murphy w- needed to run a sub 72 minute half marathon um, to get her Olympic qualifying trials time. Um, she was she was set up to run the Milltown half marathon, which is here in Washington State. It was cold. It was wet. It was windy. It hasn't been run that fast in the past. And the former women's course record was like 117 and change maybe. Um, and the field wasn't going to be very big or very deep. Um, not only did she win it outright, she uh, <laughs> like win it, winning the overall race. I think she like came in very close to the top male. So she had this person with her to push her, which I think is amazing. Yeah. Um, she took the overall win and she ran 110.34 in yeah. full tights and a long sleeve shirt. Yeah. So freaking cool. I was so, so excited fast. for her. Yeah. So first real road half marathon too. Maybe yeah. so big, big deal. So she'll now kind of migrate, I think more back to the trail. I think she's doing like, I think she's doing broken arrow stuff and then Zagama stuff. I think she might do the U S champs too. the, which is coming up. So centipede. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah. She would, I, I imagine that getting onto that world's team would be, a big deal for her since she had to miss last year, kind of last minute, I mm-hmm. think pulled out with that, with the injury that she was dealing with for much last season. And then I think the only other thing that we need to talk about on the results side is that this will come out right after Lake Sonoma. We're recording right before Lake Sonoma. Actually, we're recording the, the marathon just finished up um, mm-hmm. out there. It is Friday of Lake Sonoma weekend as we record this. Um, we are so excited before we hit record. We are both like, oh my goodness, Lake Sonoma is like getting the like, field that this race should have deserves to have um we've both run it before you have run it much 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 better than i have and i'm wondering as you as you sit in your portland abode knowing what is going (laughs) on at lake sonoma this weekend like what are you thinking about it it's definitely my favorite 50 mile race on in the United States, I'd say, I know it's kind of a bold statement, but I love that race. The community is amazing. And those trails are just so unrelenting. And so I feel like it's a really fun course to have really stout fields travel to. And so I'm really excited that it's now a qualifying race for the U S mountain running team, because I think it's, it's getting crowds back to, you know, what it used to get when it was a golden ticket race um, back when we ran it. And so I'm really, really excited for that. And I'm also kind of jealous. Like I love that race. And every year it goes on that I don't race it. I'm like, ah, oh, I should go race it. Um, having raced it three times. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't it, it proves that runner amnesia is real, obviously, because obviously it's a super fun race, but it's still 50 miles. And so you still don't feel great during it sometimes. <laughs> and it's death by like a thousand tiny cuts. Like the course mm-hmm. is unrelenting. It's oftentimes like the first warm weekend of the year for folks. You've run it in the fall as well when it was like really, really hot, but yeah. it's, um, it's going to be the first warm weekend for the Californians as well, for the folks coming out of the mountains for it. 
Um, folks like Sarah Kai is coming from the East coast for it. Like people are coming out of winter for it. And I think it like, I don't think it's supposed to hit 80. I think it's gonna be in the seventies, but like, if you've been running in tights in thirties and forties, seventies is going to feel really warm. So Mm -hmm. akin to the fact that I was just in the sauna prepping for Madeira, which will be freezing cold for the first eight hours, I'm sure, Mm -hmm. um, goes to show you that man, that first warm race of the year just Mm -hmm. sucks. Yeah. And if you, I mean, I think it just reemphasizes too that sauna training is really important coming out of the winter and it will help 100%. Yeah. <laughs> Could not agree more. So if you are listening to this and you have a hot, you've got your first race coming up in the next, let's call it six weeks. Think about getting a week of sauna in um, as you approach race day, just because like, yeah, even if it's the first, it could be the first warm weekend in May, you never know. And it's like, it's going to feel brutal, even if it's only in the seventies or eighties. Um, so my Texas people know what I'm talking about, but you Coloradans, people in the Pacific Northwest, you Californians who have been just suffering like immense rain all winter. Um, yeah. Some sauna in your future will help a ton. Yeah. And if you want to go back and listen, you go back to episode 19 and we talk about heat training and discuss kind of the protocol that we use. So go listen. Keely with the hot take with the fast hot take there. Okay. We're going to move on to some news. We've got some just kind of some fun stuff um, over the weekend. The women's NCAA basketball final took place and it was an incredible game between um, LSU and Iowa. Um, LSU taking the win there. It was really, 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 really cool. Keely, as a as a former basketball player, I was going to say basketballer, which I don't think is a real term, um, player yourself, like I know that you might not have been, you probably, you probably weren't able to watch it because you were out at the gorge race, which is okay. It's a, <laughs> that's a, a fair trade-off. I'm just wondering kind of like reading up about the game, um, post post-mortem, like how are you feeling about it? Like what were the takeaways, et cetera? Yeah. Well, I think that one thing that is very obvious to me is that just the state of women's basketball is insane right now. And that the amount of talent that is coming into the sport is really high. And so, which is to me was very obvious in the final score of the game, like the winning team at 102 points, which like, you just don't see that in the NCAA, especially not in a final, like they set a record for the most points scored in a final. And so it just like talks to the breadth of these teams, right? It's not like one girl had 40 points. Like they were pretty well spread. Um, like Angel Reese from LSU, she had a triple double. It was like her 38th triple double of the year or something. Like these women are just so all around athletes and all of the women on the team are contributing. Like, I think there was a freshman even on LSU that also had 12 points. Like, so it's just really cool to see how deep these women's teams are and then how that relates to like the final scores and, and just women's basketball in general. Um, and obviously like this was represented too, in like how many viewers there were watching this. So many. Um, Um, viewers. Yeah. Which is awesome. And it's also like a testament to the sport becoming like way more competitive and way more entertaining as well as gaining a lot more funding and a lot more FaceTime, right? Like being actually put out in front of the public to be able to watch and promoted. Um, Like you pulled these numbers, but it kind of blew my mind that there were almost 10 million viewers, right? Across ABC and ESPN, ESPN coverage of this, this final championship game for LSU and Iowa in the women's NCAA finals. Um, And that's way more than usual. And it's almost like on brand with how many people watch the men's. Yeah. And it's actually, it's on par with NBA finals. So yeah, they had 9.9 million viewers on average. And then it peaked, I think at 12.6 million viewers uh, via ESPN. Uh, The NBA finals um, last year, I think was reported at 9.89 million viewers NFL broadcast, like the N- the average NFL broadcast um, last season brought in 9.58 million viewers. Um, Men's March Madness regional files had 9.1 million viewers with a 14 million peak during the men's final. Um, and they believe that this is largely due to like the increased investment in U.S. women's sports, particularly in soccer and basketball. And like money, money matters speaking, like speaking to that. I know we've covered kind of the drama in the past where, um, the treatment of the women's teams versus treatment of the men's teams was like, there's a ton of disparity there. You remember those locker room and like gym photos where the women had like a set of free weights and the men had like a full Olympic lifting setup. Um, 
In 2021, (laughs) a report found that the NCAA undervalued women's basketball by over $100 million. Wow. They undervalued it by that much. And ESPN currently pays the NCAA $34 million for the rights to show women's basketball. Like, my favorite thing that came out of the weekend was all of these, like, really great posts from, like... um, parody now and you know kind of these like women women's first sporting orgs were like wait people don't watch women's sports um you know just kind of like the the sarcasm was was rich um Mm. it was just really cool to see like the general excitement over the women's finals yeah yeah and I think that this kind of reminds me of another part of the weekend was that even though there are there's going to be increased viewership I do think that the general population is still not used to watching women's sports as much as men's sports. And so I feel like there was a lot of articles that came out about the sportsmanship between Caitlin Clark, who is like arguably one of the better players on Iowa and Angel Reese, who's one of LSU stars because Angel Reese was being covered by Caitlin and was kind of doing some, you know, like they were both trash talking. Exactly. They were were trash trash talking. talking. For sure. Um, And I think it made a lot of viewers uncomfortable. I think at the end of the day, it just in general made people feel very uncomfortable to see women kind of duking it out. Um, And I feel like that's normal. Like we see that in a lot of sports. People are not comfortable with that yet. Right. But like you're allowed to be confident in yourself. You're like a high level athlete. And so hopefully as women's sports gets more airtime and more viewers, people will just accept that as part of the sport. And that's not something we need to hide anymore. Like we're allowed to be confident athletes. Yeah. I think the big thing was that the, when people, when it was being reported or when, when Caitlin and Angel via the media were being like pitted against each other, it was like, well, they're, they're playing in a championship event against each other. Like that's, that's a natural, like, it's not like you don't, you don't have to artificially pit them against each other. Like, right they are playing against each other yep. in the championship game. It was the coverage and and the media making a big deal of yep. this, like, you know, of the combative nature of the, like, you know, individual trash talking, like them, the media needing to make it a big deal. That to me was like the, the sexist or racist component of which mm-hmm. it was like, we wouldn't talk, we wouldn't make this a big deal if in the men's, in the men's right. championship game, yep. we don't make it. We're not trying to like pits like Steph Curry against someone. And mm-hmm. then like the, I think the further backlash was the like, and, and Caitlin actually spoke to this, I think really mm-hmm. wonderfully too, being like, I don't want to criticize Angel Reese. Like we all, like, we all do that. We all like talk trash, like highlighting Angel being herself and like being like, I think that they all deserve to be even co- like to be cockier. They all should be cockier. I think <laughs> they're, they're both like phenomenal players. Um, we don't let women do that. And so it's like, not only do we not let women do that, but I think like, because it was a black woman doing it like that, like that's why it was getting called out. And it's like, mm-hmm. Caitlin Clark talks trash too. Like <laughs> let them talk trash. They're really freaking good at basketball. They're in the championship yeah. game at the NCAA finals. Like it's yeah. So media folks people that watch, try to watch women's sports, like they're competitive human beings. They like, they have the, they, they have the drive to be as good as they are. They both set records. The team as a whole set records. Like they didn't get there without the drive to be as good as they are. Like that's going to come along with like a deserved right to be, to be cocky and humble, to be like brash and funny, to be, you know, in each other's faces. Like that is, that is competition. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Yeah. And it's it really wild. cool to see that women are now, they have the amount of confidence they need to actually be trash talking mm-hmm. before. Like we weren't confident enough to even do it. And so it's really cool to see the change. Yeah. And it's one of those things too. It's like, we're like, they still have respect for one mm-hmm. another. Like you can like tease each other or like get in each other's heads and still have respect for that other person. At the end of the day, they're going to shake hands and tell each other, you know, good game, you know, like wait, like put, you put yourself out there. And I think that goes for like being competitive in the ultra space too, right? Like we can want to, we can want everyone to succeed. We can want ourselves to like destroy people. We can want to, you know, in quotes, crush bitches. Um, but I think it's like at the end of the day, like we're still going to like, we still respect the hell out of each other. Mm-hmm. And it's like yeah, exactly. sport, sports and sporting media needs to allow women to, to say brash things, to say confident things and like not be called, bossy or egotistical or whatever Mm -hmm. claim your space ladies the other bit of news that i pulled was um another kind of 
VC-esque fund that has gotten off the ground. It's called the Mar- Monarch Collective. It's a $100 million fund to start um, that has been created by the founder of one of the founders of Angel City um, FC, Karen Nortman. Um, the goal is to invest in women's sports. The, it aims to advocate for women's sports because there is indeed interest in women's sports, which is what we spent the last 15 minutes talking about. And they want to translate that potential into dollars. Again, Karen Nortman, um, she's a former managing partner at Upfront Venture. She's one of the co-founders of, um, of Angel City v, of Angel City FC. Um, she's joined by Jasmine Robinson, who is a partner at this at a VC firm and is a former ex-exec um, for the SF 49ers. Um, they're putting where their money where their mouth is, which is really cool. Um, and so it's going to be invested into teams, leagues, and adjacent revenue streams like media and gaming. Um, I don't know if anyone follows women's soccer, but like a a FIFA-esque women's soccer game came out recently and like all the women's players were like, wait, that's me? Like being like, that doesn't like, they're like, I'm bald in this version of the game. And then I have like crazy hair in this version of the game. Like things are getting wild. So um, gaming could have a little bit more investment there maybe uh, to make things realistic. But essentially I pulled two quotes from the article, um, which was covered by um, finance over at Yahoo. And it says, uh, we what is needed to grow and scale women's sports is like any business. You need real capital flowing into the ecosystem. So Nortman says, Nortman and Robinson hope that the dedicated 100 million fund will be the game changer for the whole ecosystem. And then they went on to say, um, they aim to develop content and programming for women's sports fans and bring in advertisers beyond brands like Nike and Heineken that dominate men's sports that will speak to female consumers who control 80% of household spending. And so it's like, there are eyes on women's sports. There are dollars that can be dedicated to women's sports. Um, and so it's really cool to see two women stepping up together to launch, you know, a big, a big round of funding for various women's sports. So we can um, link to that Monarch Collective piece in our show notes, um, but it's cool. And I'm very excited to see what happens and what comes of it. Before we dive into the meat and potatoes, we have to give a shout out to one of our other sponsors of the show. That is The Feed. We love The Feed. Actually, I accidentally ordered my next feed shipment to my brother's apartment. So I have to go find it um, because it is not here and it has critical things in it like recovery drink mix and gummies and waffles and my new Trail Society water bottle. So mm. I will be finding it this weekend. Get to see my brother soon. Hopefully he has the package with him. But if you also want to experience the feed, you can go over to www.thefeed.com slash trail society. There you can enter some information to get a quarterly credit of $15 as well as a fancy, really cool trail society water bottle. Um, I have not gotten my hands on mine yet, but We've, we've been starting to get tagged in people's Instagram posts with their water bottles. And we want to encourage you to continue to do that because it's really, really cool to see them out in the wild. Yeah. My, my old professor from undergrad who encouraged me to forego medical school coming out of undergrad and pursue running got one and just sent me a picture with, with it and her dog and was like, still cheering you on. And it was the greatest photo I've ever received. So if you're listening, Dr. Nelson, <laughs> thank you. Dr. Nelson, shout out. <laughs> Shout out to Dr. <laughs> Nelson. We love you. Um, yeah. So try them. It's, you know, kind of your one-stop shop for all your nutrition needs. You can mix and match things. You can buy one-off flavors of things. If you're like any of the athletes that both of us coach, you, we probably are harping on you about trying nutrition products, trying nutrition products on your long run. If you don't have a local running store to go to, the feed is a great way to do that where you can mix and match, try different flavors, try different brands to find what's really going to work for you come race day. Or maybe you're going to a race where you like, they're going to have a very specific nutrition product that you normally don't use. Like, I don't know, gnarly or goo or scratch, whatever it is. If you want to practice with it ahead of time so that you know you can use the nutrition that's going to be at the aid station, that's a way to do it. You can order that packet of Roctane. You can order that packet of Fuel 2O, et cetera, and just get it into your system and see how it sits. If it's a 12, race day got a lot easier because they're going to have that product for you at the aid stations. So fun fact, that's a little hack for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I did that with an athlete for Gorge. They had never tried spring. And so I sent them some spring that I got off the feed so they could try it. That's so nice of you. So they could try before the race and ended up that they were able to stomach it a little bit at the race due to practicing, which is better than the alternative, (laughs) which is 
not stomaching it yeah, and exactly. walking so, for miles and miles like mm-hmm. a sad panda. Yeah. It does help to practice the, the race day nutrition. Yeah. Yeah. We'll harp on you guys about that more at a later date, but we're going to talk about some, our meat and potatoes today is about illness and being sick. And let's face it, like being sick sucks, but it happens. It happens to all of us. You guys all remember Keely coughing, like part of the winter, a lot of the winter. Um, You might yourself be at home coughing right now. And so the inspiration for this topic hits close to home because dun, 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 dun. My athlete roster has got a bunch of sick people on it right now. I'm thinking like eight-ish athletes are currently sick or just getting over being sick. Two recently actually had to miss a race due to recent illness and three or four of them have COVID. Um, and so COVID the flu, all these fun things. Uh, I've got a lot of parents that I coach. So they're like constantly kind of sick because their kids are constantly sick. It's a fun rep like repetition that we've got going on, but it can be really stressful. Like it's less stressful for many of us to get sick in November. We don't have a race on the horizon. It is now April getting sick in April starts to become a bigger stressor for many of us. Keely. Do you have any sick athletes right now? I actually don't. And I don't have nearly as many athletes as you. And I true. feel like a lot of my athletes were sick in the, the December, January months. So I feel like they might have got it out of their systems. Ooh. Knock on wood. I'm going to log off here and go on final surge and have like 10 comments about <laughs> being sick. <laughs> Yeah. I've had, yeah, I had a bunch of athletes travel recently. And I think that is, that is part of it, mm-hmm. but yeah, it's just like getting sick is real. I've traveled the last two weekends. I've traveled masked because of that, because I've got a big race coming up and like, I don't want to get sick right now. Like knock on the fake wood that my desk is built out of. I don't want to get sick. So we'll, you know, we'll see if I can make it there, but you know, it's, it's going to happen. It happens to all of us. And I think one of the things I was thinking about as we are ruminating on this topic is that, And like, I've had this piece of advice stuck in my head for a decade now, um, over a decade now, I just turned 33. So it's getting, it's getting college is further and further in the, in the rear view mirror. Um, I've got, I was coached by this like old Norwegian woman. She wasn't old at the time in my head. She's old. Um, this Norwegian woman who was like kind of a hard ass and like, definitely like, you know, she would jump into intervals and kick our butt type of thing. But she was like, she had this like adamant piece of advice is that when we got sick, we weren't allowed to return to training until we were symptom free or at least felt normal. I'm using air quotes here for 48 hours, as opposed to the like, oh, I finally woke up feeling good today. I'm going to go for a run or I'm going to join the team for practice. She Mm -hmm. said that we had to feel normal for 48 hours. So two days of that before we are allowed to return to training. And that has stuck with me ever since. And I'm wondering, Keely, if there's been any like weird advice it could be, you know, something your mom said, a coach said, something that you picked up from people along the way, as far as like, in regards to being, to getting sick, to being sick, something that's stuck with you over time. My go-to advice is that, you know, taking two days off now, three days off now to potentially not have to take days off later, like to just nail, nip it in the butt now yeah. is, is, is not going to like be detrimental to your training. And so that's kind of my my rule of thumb is just like, Hey, if I'm sick now, or I have something that makes me like feel a little weird when I'm running like a little niggle, or I'm feeling really, really, really drained, like taking two or three or four days off just so that it doesn't get worse could like allow you to not have to take a month or two months off later. Right. Because yeah, sickness might not be the same as an injury, but sicknesses can linger for a really, really long time. If you don't get rid of them, especially if you're training a lot. And so like, you know, training with half your lung capacity, because you have bronchitis, not great for training. Not (laughs) Not good. Speaking from personal experience, Keely, not good. Not good. No. I've done it as well. And it's just like, no, just take the time, get over the sickness, let your body heal and you're not going to lose any fitness. Yeah. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a second. The other piece of advice I think that stuck with me that just occurred to me was the, like, I don't, I'm sure you've heard this. I'm sure listeners have heard this, the difference between like training with a head cold versus like, if it's in your chest. And mm-hmm. I was told that I was allowed to exercise with a head cold, mm-hmm. like stuffy nose, you know, et cetera, congestion versus like, if it's moved into your chest, you know, if it's a cough, et cetera, um, even like moving into sore throat territory that that was like, mm, no, no, no. Like mm. we're not going to train through that. You can train with the head, but, but I don't, I don't yeah. think that that advice is necessarily like 
a hard and fast rule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But totally that was probably like, defends. and I don't know that I would like do an interval workout with like a ton of congestion, mm-hmm. et cetera. But it was like yeah. the idea of like level of severity or level mm-hmm. of like how quickly you're going to kick something maybe Mm -hmm. was the idea of like head cold. We can mess with the head cold. It's like a tiny Mm -hmm. bit. Um, Yeah. And it's like a, it's another equation of like the stress plus stress equals stress thing. Right. Because your body doesn't really know that running stress is not sickness stress. And so, you know, if you're someone who is actually very sick, you're not sleeping very well, you're not eating very well because you have no appetite. You're not getting in good fluids. Like, yeah you're not setting yourself up well to run. And so adding that additional running stress to a battered body, not helpful. That's yeah. very much too much stress. That's always a good time to um, reflect on like what is provoking the anxiety that makes you feel like you have to train through this, through this injury, through this illness, et cetera, through the smoke, through whatever it might be. Like, I think taking a moment to like evaluate how, like how and why you feel that way is like a continual thing of importance because like you're not doing justice to your training. You're not doing justice to your health and well-being um, by like continuing to, to batter your body um, by training through an injury illness or like inclement weather, right? Negative 20 degrees or, you know, a horrible air quality, et cetera. That's different than not wanting to run because it's raining. That's a different, that's a different set of, set of like mental, mental fatigue totally. type thing, but it's like, yep. I always ask athletes to kind of like reflect on like, why are you feeling this way? Like, where is this anxiety coming from? Um, yeah. Is it real? Right. And I, I mean, I deal with that often too, especially like when you have additional stressors, sometimes running becomes a little bit of a coping mechanism. And I think Mm -hmm. in like in very small doses, running can be a really good coping mechanism, but I do think when you run a lot and you start really relying on running to be your coping mechanism and you can't bring yourself to take time off, then it really starts to come into question, like, well, why am I running? You know, that becomes a little unhealthy. And especially if you're trying to make running something you want to be really serious at and take it very seriously, you can't use it as your only coping mechanism because then you're going to be running through things that you just don't need to run through. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's really good to take a step back and be like, what am I doing this for? Is this helpful to my long-term goals? Or is this satisfying some really like animalistic, angry need that I have right now? Um, Yeah. This is how I got really into baking in 2012. <laughs> the national team coaches told me point blank that I couldn't run every time I was stressed or scared or angry or sad, um, that I needed to find a different a different coping strategy. Um, a therapist probably would have been the best recommendation at that point in time. <laughs> that is not what they recommended. Um, and I started baking and it turned out that I could bake through most things except for anger. Whenever I baked and I was angry, like the cookies were always super weird. Um but I did, I got really into baking as my alternative coping mechanism, um, in like 2010, 2011, 2012, um, I would recommend therapy instead. Um, but one of the stressors, which is, which is a real feeling, um, beyond like, um, the need to exercise is this idea that you're missing training and that taking time off is going to set you back or that you're going to detrain during this window. And yes, some illnesses are long mono, um, Lyme COVID. disease, uh, COVID, COVID um, the flu. Like if you haven't gotten your flu shot this year, um, some years the flu is really mild. Some years the flu is like hospitalizing healthy individuals type of thing. So those are things that like, yes, we're starting to talk about longer and longer windows. Um, but we're talking about stuff that's like, say in the two to three week window, like 14 to 21 days max window. Like I think talking through like what detraining quote unquote um, actually looks like during that period would be, would be kind of valid. And I'm wondering kind of like personal experience there too, both like as an athlete and as a coach of athletes, you know, one, how do you deal with, with like walking an athlete through this idea that they're not going to detrain because they have to take two, three, seven, 10 days off. <laughs> yeah. That's not an easy task. Right. Uh, cause I think you can show them literature. You can talk about the research and again, I think it depends on the athlete's mindset, if they're going to believe you or not, or mm-hmm. they want to believe you. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I really do try to emphasize that, you know, time off now is going to help you long-term and that yet you can't lose like fitness in like a 10 day period. And so if we have to take a week off because you're really, really sick, or you have a little like angry ankle, cause you twisted it, that mm-hmm. is okay but it's only 10 days or seven days or whatever it is. And none of that is going to really impact your fitness. 
but not taking that time off and then having to take two months off later that will impact your fitness. And so it's almost like think in the long term and acknowledge that like taking a little bit of time off now is not going to impact your fitness at all, but it could impact it really detrimentally if you let it go on for a long time. Yeah. And if that emotional support doesn't help you, I am here to provide numbers uh, around detraining because this is, I feel like a fact or fiction piece that I feel like I constantly come up against personally and also with athletes. And so when we spent time digging through the literature here, then this is like, they're putting people into like pretty serious bouts, bouts of rest artificially or otherwise. Um, when they do that, and we're talking like rest, rest, like oftentimes bed rest or like wheelchair rest. Um, Mm -hmm. it's not a fun study to volunteer for, I don't think. And so basically they, they see if you take 10 days, zero, zero exercise, you don't see any fall off in 10 days. That's a pretty long window for most people dealing with a short niggle or a common, a common illness, right? 10 days, not a lot. They also saw that, you know, these, this decay is not linear. So essentially what that means is that you see changes in that decrease over time. I.e. they said after two weeks of no running, the literature indicates that you experience approximately a 6% decrease in VO2 max. So it's two, two weeks. So nothing for 10 days at two weeks, about 6%. After nine weeks, there's then a 19% decrease, 11 weeks, 25% decrease. So you, you got to be out significantly out with no exercise for a long period of time. And actually a lot of that, like initial decay and about, and about the first month is due to just a decrease in blood plasma volume. And so that like, that is something that comes back pretty quickly. A lot of the stuff that you feel when you're coming back to exercise after time, time off is blood plasma volume. Cause that affects cardiac output. Mm-hmm. Um, very jargony there. Um, Maybe you sauna during this. I was going to just say that. Maybe we throw in the sauna. <laughs> Get your sweat on in a different way, as long as you're not feverish. Um, and then the other piece of that puzzle too is like the neuromuscular component where you just like, you don't feel quick. And it's like, once you get back into running, it starts to feel better. After you do your first hard interval session, it starts to feel better. So, you know, that's basically a long time period off, very slow decline. A lot of that initial decline is actually just a drop in blood plasma volume. They also looked, so they looked at VO2 max and then they looked at lactate threshold. So kind of like that one hour, um, that one hour effort where, where you see lac- blood lactate start to really climb um, in a big way. So they said when I'm going to quote myself here, starting at around 14 days of inactivity, we also, you begin that's to see, two weeks. that's two weeks. You begin to see, and that's, that's no activity. You see changes in mitochondrial density um, and, and enzyme activity decline, both of which affect how well your muscles utilize oxygen and metabolize other energy for muscular activity. Um, this is what would cause a decline in your lactate threshold or the intensity at which you can no longer utilize lactate aerobically. So what that says there is, so VO2 max upper, upper, upper end of things, really slow decline. LT still really slow decline. We don't start to see a decrease in that until about 14 days. As soon as you introduce stimuli again to this stuff, it really starts to get turning over very, very, very quickly. So it's like small declines, really easy to recoup. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is me trying to use numbers to cause less panic in your brains. I don't know if it's working. Maybe it's causing more panic. We'll find out later when you DM us. Um, I think the other big, big takeaway for me was that they found that when you decrease activity, um, say you've got a nickel and you've got a decreased volume or say you've got, you got a head cold or you take a couple of days off and then you're slowly working back into training, I think would be like the most practical example, right? Um, you know, maybe you're running every other day, running one day, walking one day, et cetera. Maybe you're spinning. Um, it indicates that you can decrease training by 30 to 40%, um, and see no significant decrease in fitness. So having to take a couple of days off and then slowly build back in is going to cause zero ill effect to your baseline fitness. Okay. Keely gave you this emotional thing about supporting you as a whole human and how amazing you are and how that like, you're like running is just something that you do and that it's still going to be there for you. And you need to take care of yourself. And then I came in with these like really annoying numbers and percentages that were probably more confusing than anything all to say, you have to take a significant period of time off to see declines. Um, a little activity goes a long way and you really quickly recoup those losses, even if you had to be bedridden for three to four weeks. Yeah. 
I'm I'm experiencing this firsthand right now with my current MCAT study routine. My my mileage slash volume has gone down about 30%. And so, you know, people keep saying like, oh, are you training? Like, why aren't you running a ton right now? And I'm just like, well, first of all, have you ever tried to do an MCAT with a broken brain? (laughs) Because it doesn't work (laughs) while running hundred mile weeks. Um, And the second thing is that because my fitness is maintaining just fine, I'm not losing anything. And to know that and be okay with that and accept that is really, really important because otherwise I would be going crazy and I'd be trying to run, you know, like 85, 90 miles a week while studying six to 10 hours a day. And I would do neither of the things well. We're very proud of you. The free trail fam is very proud of you. Our smarty, our smarty, our MCAT, our future, our future doctor, our future MD. Hope so. Um, and then you'll come back and school us all on all of our things, all things immune system. Um, one more thing that I wanted to talk about before we talk about kind of low energy availability, other things that can like really impact your immune system is that this, there's like two, like, I don't think either one's really a misconception. I guess I had them labeled as misconceptions, but basically like we know that moderate exercise most days. And so we're talking 60 minutes. We as an ultra running community like to really overdo what moderate exercise is. That's a discussion for (laughs) another day. But um, we do know from the science that there aren't, there aren't real good ways to like quote unquote boost your immune system. Um, We talk a lot about doing that kind of thing. It's that's like kind of hokey. Anyway, we do know that like moderate exercise, so like 60 minutes a day of aerobic activity does quote unquote boost your immune system's function, um, which could then, you know, downstream effects of that would be like increase your resistance to mild infections in the common cold. Um, the idea behind this and why it works, and then we'll talk about why it can get extreme and maybe not work as well, um, is that you just enhance the recirculation of things like immunoglobulins, the little things that are going to bounce around to, uh, look for invaders and you've got anti-inflammatory cytokines. So they're going to help regulate inflammatory response. You've got neutrophils. That's part of your innate immune system and lymphocytes part of your adaptive immune system. So essentially it's like you're circulating the things that look for invaders, mimic, like then learn about invaders, et cetera. You're just like, you're, you're circling through your system a lot more. It's like, Mm -hmm. go for a walk. It's good for you type of thing. Um, Mm -hmm. The other side of that coin is the, we go from moderate to extreme exercise, <laughs> like running hundred miles, something we all love to do. <laughs> maybe, maybe you're considering it. And there's this um, idea that, you know, extreme exercise then could impair your immune system. And this has been known as what's called the open window theory for a very long time. And this idea is that there's this period of like three to 72 hours in which your immune system, like totally shits the bed. Hillary's not here. And apparently I swear now, um, like your immune system stops working is the idea. And that's why they call it the open window theory. Like the window's open for invaders. Ha ha ha. Um, and they initially were like, when they, they were doing blood draws and they're finding like people like had this huge drop off in lymphocytes, which is a white blood cell, really important for the immune system function. They found that there's this like severe drop off of lymphocytes and they're like, Oh my goodness, they're dying off. Like exercise kills your white blood cells. People were panicking. Um, it turns out that actually they're just like redeployed to tissue where like to tissues where you might be more likely to see invaders like lung tissue, et cetera. So it's like the lymphocytes are redistributed in your body. So while the open window theory isn't necessarily like a hard and fast rule, we do know that stress is stress is stress and things in and around racing. Cause we do know that like people are more likely to get sick after a big race, but generally it's because it involves travel. You've just experienced a high stressor. Your cortisol is high. You've had poor sleep. You've had uh, improper, you know, illness preventing hygiene, you're touching everything. Um, then you're touching your eyeballs, you know, just human behavior. So it's like, it's not really so much the activity decreasing your immune function as it is the things in and around racing Mm -hmm. are us putting ourselves in a position to be more exposed to bacteria and other fun things while also maybe not having like the most hyped, amazing immune system possible. So moderate exercise, good. We love it. Extreme exercise, maybe just like be a little bit careful and like, I don't know, wash your hands and like stop putting them in your eyeballs. Like that'd be great. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah. But I think, I think on a more serious note, I, I do think that if you go into a really big race, really overcooked, 
Mm -hmm. then after the race, you're probably going to be more susceptible to illness just because of all of that chronic stress you just experienced, not only during the race, but before the race, because, you know, we have shown that chronic stress, which is like chronically elevated levels of cortisol, Mm -hmm. um, do increase your risk of getting sick and stress is stress is stress, right? Like before a big race, you're likely to put in a huge training block. Mm -hmm. stress is stress. Yeah. Stress. Yeah. And like, if you're like me, I'm sure you've been in this too before when you're in the weeds of training, like when I wasn't monitoring how well I was training and how well I was feeling, like I was sick all of the time, Mm -hmm. but I was, you know, chronically under fueled and in low energy availability. I was amenorrheic for five years. Like my body was not functioning. There was a chronically elevated level of cortisol that was chronically telling me that my body was inflamed, right? Like that there was other bigger problems than reserving all of these white blood cells to to (laughs) fight off microbes, right? Like it was saying like, Hey, there's other things going on. And so they have shown that in low energy availability, especially for women who are amenorrheic, there are, you know, relationships between those things and decreased immunity. And so, you know, if you are someone who's training a lot, maybe unwilling to take off days and find yourself getting sick all the time, like that could be kind of your body signaling to you that you do need a break. Um, Yeah. yeah. I love that. It's like the call is coming from inside the house, right? It's like, we don't have time to pay attention to these things that are going to give you upper respiratory tract infections because (laughs) the call is coming from inside the house. (laughs) We have bigger problems. The alarms are going off in here all the time. Yeah, exactly. It's just like your body can't do everything. It has bigger fish to fry. And so, yeah, it's like, that's why, you know, you lose your menstrual cycles as well, because it's like, Hey, I don't have the energy to do this right now. I cannot fathom having a child because I am diverting all of my energy sources to other things. And so, yeah, I do think that like, while there's no real evidence that says like exercise 100% will cause decreased immunity. I do think that chronic stress in relation to something like overtraining or low energy availability could make you more likely to have some sort of sickness flare up. And that could be a warning sign. Yeah. And here's the, like the canary in the coal mine scenario in which it's like, maybe you ignored the amenorrhea or maybe, maybe you're on like, um, you're on like Mirena. Right. And so you like have lost the like bleeding portion of your cycle. Or you don't get a menstrual cycle for other reasons. Like for, yeah, for, for many other reasons. Um, I did like, yeah, I've got, I was talking to a friend about this other day. She's like, I've got, I've had a hysterectomy. I like, can't, I can't believe, um, I don't have, I don't have a uterus. We were talking about like how to identify how, how humans identify. And, and she was mm-hmm. like, I, you know, we'll say people with the uterus. I don't have one of those. Um, mm-hmm. so yeah, don't have that canary in the coal mine. Another canary in the coal mine is if you are chronically getting upper respiratory tract infections in particular, because that like should use a lot of your first line of defense, right? There's a lot of stuff between your, like your nose hole and your mouth mm-hmm. hole and like your lungs, you shouldn't be getting upper respiratory tract infections, your immune system your like innate immune system and your adaptive immune system are not doing their jobs. And that is a great canary in the coal mine of like, Ooh, okay. Like something's off. Like maybe it's training, maybe it's recovery, maybe it's fueling, but that's like a good, like, that's a good red flag of like, okay, one, I would like to not be sick all the time Two, There's probably something else going on and we should figure this out. And that was definitely something that I dealt with when I was in like my, like in the peak of overtraining and just my body being like in full shutdown mode was that I, I had chronic upper respiratory tract infections. Mm -hmm. And then I got put on a bunch of antibiotics, which had like all sorts of fun downstream effects. So like my body just really not loving life. Um, so I think that, yeah, kind of pointing out that low energy availability does have impacts on the immune system, um, is kind of an important tie into what we talk about so much on here. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, not awesome, but you know what I mean? don't do it. This is us telling you not to do it. Um, I think the last thing that I really wanted to touch on here was like, how do we avoid getting sick? Right. It's luck of the draw. Like a lot of you are sitting at home listening with like a toddler and it's like, yeah, I'm sorry. They're just like a sticky monster and they have, they, they go to daycare or pre pre K or kindergarten and they're just going to bring everything home to you. I'm sorry. Like that kind of sucks. You have to ride that roller coaster, but there are other things that you can do to kind of avoid getting sick. Um, we just talked about, you know, monitoring exercise load, um, avoiding nutritional deficiencies and caloric deficiencies. But again, it's like kind of in and around those races or in and around periods of high training load, like 
Okay. Practicing good personal hygiene. And I'm not just talking about showering. Like you should all shower or bathe or do whatever your personal preference is. But that means like washing your hands. That means like washing your hands frequently. That means washing your hands in and around food, like preparing food and meals and watch how you're touching your face. And you're, I'm going to keep talking about touching your eyeballs. Stop touching your eyeballs. I do it all the time. As soon as I get on a plane, I just want to stick my fingers in my eyeballs and I don't know why. Um, don't do that. And then like practicing stress management and like getting really good sleep. Like those are some of your biggest defenders. Um, I fell victim to this in the 2019 UTMB. I was ready to have a really, really good day. I came into that race super freaking fit, like just mega fit, like bouncing up the stairs fitness where you're just like, oh yeah, like I'm, I've got something. And then I got a stomach bug from hell because Chamonix is basically a cruise ship in August (laughs) where you bring thousands of people from all over the world and plop them in one town together. And I like was overextended doing events and probably didn't wash my hands enough, probably didn't like use enough proper sanit- like sanitizing stuff, like was just around too many people too much of the time. So if you've got a big race coming up, maybe that means like, yeah, you're going to mask when you go to the grocery store yeah. right now or um, mask on transit, or you're just going to be more adamant about taking care of yourself. And I think to me, that's been like the biggest lesson learned over the last couple of years too, is like, There are times of the year where I probably play it a little fast and loose with some of these rules, but like it's April. I've had to travel already this month, like trying to be really cognizant of like, am I sleeping enough? Am I eating enough? Am I being a sanitizing freak? A hundred percent. Yeah. I think I've realized this, like I got invited to a party like the Monday night before black canyons and maybe Sunday. And I was considering it. And JT kind of just looked at me like, we're not going to go. Yeah. Why, like why? Like, What's the point yeah. right now? And I think, you know, rewind four years, I would not have even considered not going, but mm-hmm. I do think that the COVID pandemic kind of resurfaced everything in your mind and that you can decide to not, you know, go into a really big group of people a week before one of your major races, just to decrease the odds of you getting sick. Um, And while, you know, don't do that every single weekend, you get invited to do something, but like, it's okay to be selfish if you do have a really big race coming up um, to avoid, you know, really large social interactions the weekend before. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I remember playing this game through college too, of like, oh, you're sick. Cool. We're going to be over here type of thing. Like it's okay to temporarily ostracize your bestie if they pick up something. Um, okay. I think I'm trying to think of anything else where it's like, I'm what we're dealing with right now. I think the biggest thing, right. Is like, if you were sick, I've been dealing with this with athletes right now is like, it happens. Like it's going to feel like the end of the world, particularly the ones who've had to miss races because of it. But it's like, that wasn't wasted. Like the build wasn't wasted. Um, the training that you've done is not wasted. You're an end and you're not going to lose the fitness that you've built. You might come back feeling a little bit shaky to start, but you're going to be able to rebuild quickly. And it's just like being kind to yourself, being patient, understanding that a few days off or a week off and a week rebuild or two weeks off and a week rebuild isn't going to set you back months and months and months. Like you're going to be able to bounce back fairly quickly. So I think that's the biggest, the biggest takeaway is like, it happens. There are kinder times of the year for it to happen. And then like, yeah, if you get maybe sick, say you get sick like 10 days before your goal race, Like that's a decision point, right? It's like, can you race? Should you race? Do you want to race? Are you willing to race with with not compromised goals, but a change in your mindset around your goals? Mm -hmm. Is the goal to be there? Is the goal to finish? Is the goal to perform to a certain level? And it's like, I think just like moderating those expectations. And then like, is it worth it to you to race with those mod, like those Mm -hmm. modified expectations? Like, and that's okay. And it's okay to not want to have modified expectations and like to pick a different race. Like Mm -hmm. that is okay. Yeah. Going into the Josh tree FKT, I was sick for like a week. So I hadn't been able to decide if I was going to do it. And so I basically just lowered all expectations and focused just on getting better. And so I really didn't run much going up to it, but felt pretty decent when I started, like definitely had kicked some of the cough and some of the cold. 
um, and was able to do it. And I think it was just because I lowered those expectations and actually tried to focus on being healthy and like getting over it and not trying to like fight it and be like, Oh my gosh, well, I need to still run and I need to still do this. And I still want to get ready for the race and run the best race I possibly can. And it's like, well, no, like, let's just try to get it, get rid of it and then see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. So expectations change you're still, you're still the person you were pre getting sick, I think is the big thing. And it's like, if you need, if you need to slide into our DMS to be like, Oh my goodness, what do I do? We're, we're here for you. So know that you can know that you can reach out with those kind of questions, concerns, or just like, honestly, like having a shoulder, like having someone to vent to about it. Like we're there for, we're there for you. You can come vent to us. Okay. Anything else, any last bits of any, any last things to add to that? Nope. We're slamming and it's exciting. We're exciting slamming this week. It's society slam. And it's brought to you by as a drum roll. I don't think you can hear it. Petzl. We're really excited to be working with Petzl. Um, literally uh, we pitched it as we're going to shine a spotlight on the community. So we want to thank Petzl for, uh, being the new, the new show sponsor specifically for the society slam question. Um, as a person with a former stutter, Society Slam was a poor choice of naming for the segment, but I did this to myself. Um, but yeah, huge shout out. I'm actually, I'm, it's, this is a, I know this is an audio podcast, so you can't see this if you're listening, but I've got my new Petzl right next to me. I'm really excited to bring it to Madeira with me. Um, it is the new Petzl Now RL. I have the old Petzl Now that I'll be wearing on my waist as a waist light. I will also have a bindi with me and an Ico core. So I will have all of the possible headlamp options. Um, I've gotten to run just a couple of runs with the new Petzl and it's super lightweight. It kind of reminds me of the old now, but it's, there's way less bounce. If you've experienced mm -hmm. Keely, I know you love the old, the old Petzl now. It's what you rock, but the, I think you're going to love the, uh, the fit and the lack of bounce while being on its brightest setting. It's more lumens than you could ever possibly need unless you're trying to scare a cougar away, which for Western States might be the perfect ticket. Yeah. I mean, I'm definitely going to try it in my next dark, dark run. <laughs> We're getting more sunlight. You're not going to have another dark. Run. I it's know. Like that's why early. I'm like, I don't think I'm going to have a dark run, but you know, when I, when I do train for States, I do do like one or two very short runs in the evening just to make sure I remember how to run with a headlamp. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited to try it out. It looks really lighter and it also has a pretty darn good battery life, especially on the reactive mode, which is if for those of you who've never used one of Petzl's reactive headlamps, it basically changes the lumens based off of how close you are to different things. So when you're in like a really wooded forest, it's going to be a lot brighter than if you go out onto this really open moon lit like ridge, it's not going to have to be nearly as bright. And so it's a pretty cool feature and it, it lasts like 10 hours on that max reactive state. Um, and so it's really solid for something like Western States, because hopefully I won't need it for, for 10 hours. That would be meaning that my day is going a little bit wrong. Yeah. You've gone sideways and you won't need a headlamp <laughs> at that point. Um, but yeah, it's rechargeable with it. So unlike like the Ico core, which I love, which uses, which you can use triple A's or the little battery packs with this one is more like the Petzl now where it's its own chargeable battery hub. Um, it does have a flashing light, which is nice. If you're racing in Europe, a lot of these races require that you have a back, a backlight for certain sections of races, Madeira does. So this is great. Mm -hmm. It also is rechargeable with a USB-C. Um, a lot of the European stuff is like kind of defaulting to USB-C. So you need a different cord, but charged super fast. Really excited about it. Um, I'm dropping it on my desk right now, but it's, it's great. And basically, you know, you can go out and, uh, pick up a headlamp wherever you, wherever you get headlamps locally, be it, be it REI or your local run store. Um, a lot of them will, will have them around. Um, and then, yeah, my other favorite is the Bindi, like the tiny little light. It's my favorite for like runs where it's, you're going to start in the darkness for 30 minutes and it's going to get light on you, or you just need something as a backup. Um, it's my go-to, my go-to backup headlamp. It's what I'll carry as my required headlamp during the day. Um, when I drop, drop my bigger headlamps off, but yeah, so head over to anywhere where you can get headlamps locally to you. If you need research market research, you can go over to petzl.com and, uh, look through the specs there, but yeah, and then pick up a headlamp near and dear to you support your local businesses. Um, we're going to slam though. 
and then we'll let you go. Thanks for waiting all this time to get to Society Slam. Um, I'm going to read from a listener. I haven't read it yet, so we'll see how this goes. They say, hey, they are dedicated listeners since episode one. Heck yeah. And they have a Society Slam for us. They said, this past weekend, I raced my first 50 kilometers since stress fracture last July. I won and got the course record coming across the line in four hours flat. But that's not the real win. I love this so much. I have goosebumps right now. Um, my nutrition was super dialed. I consumed 1,100 calories and 225 grams of carbs total, almost hitting my target of 300 calories per hour. I didn't bonk and I was able to lay down several 430 Ks. That's moving in the final stretch, sprinting across the finish line. Your podcast has really helped educate me about the importance of fueling. My mindset has completely changed in the past year. Keep spreading the word. That makes me so happy. <laughs> thank you listener thank you so much listener and, and, and congratulations so stoked. yeah, yeah like, you're right you're right the real win isn't that winning course record it's the fact that like you figured out a nutrition yeah, plan that you works for good. you mm-hmm. you feel good heck so, yeah so awesome Whew, i got goosebumps during that <clears throat> yeah um i have a similar similarly exciting society slam um i got the had the pleasure of running a fun run on the Friday of the Gorge weekend with some free trailers. Um, and I got to meet Megan and Jeff who both were running the 100 K. Um, and we ran the Pacific crest trail section. That is basically a part where they will do an out and back on twice. And so it's like around mile 40. And then it's also at like mile 57, like something very close to the finish. And I got a message from Megan after the race, um, saying that they, because they knew how close they were to the aid station, because we ran that section as a course preview, they made the the last cutoff spot by two minutes and were able to finish under the cutoff um, because they started like really booking it because they were like, okay, we know exactly where we are. We know this trail, we know how to get there. And they did it and they got there under the course cutoff. And then they finished the race 10 minutes under the cutoff. So they booked it in that last section. And I was what so stoked epic. to hear about that. Yeah. Oh my goodness. They also told Keely, good luck on the MCAT. So extra big good luck <laughs> to Keely. Um, that's really, really impressive. It was a hard day. Attrition rates were high with the weather. So huge shout outs to Meg and Jeff for getting it done. Okay. Thank you so much for sliding into our DMs with Society Slam. Again, you can do that over at the Trail Society Instagram account. You can also hit us up individually as well. It's been really fun getting to know so many of you. Um, mark your calendars for Gorge 2024. Um, I think we should all try to be there. I think they're moving it to kind of more mid-April, like maybe 12th to the 14th of April, something like yeah. that. So keep your fingers crossed on that one. <laughs> um, until next time, we'll catch you out on the trails. Bye.